Okay, thanks everybody for, uh, for, for joining us today. Um, this is the last panel of our um, very first conference and what a panel it is. Um, we're going to be discussing probably one of the most important uh, subjects really. Uh, without an industry, without people, there, was, there is no industry clearly. Um, and during the pandemic, the workforce was hit um, obviously very hard. Um, we lost a lot of good people and many of them didn't come back. Um, this panel is going to really explore how we make the events industry um, attractive to a, to a younger generation of um, potential workers, but um, also how, um, while doing that, we can, we can make sure that the, the next generation of event professionals are truly uh, diverse. Um, I'll introduce the panel. Uh, if we start right on my immediate right, we have Nick Morgan. If you don't mind... Um, uh, just talking about a little bit, obviously you're CEO of the fair, but if you could just talk a little bit about your work, just to give a bit of context as to, to your involvement with the industry. Uh, yeah, hi, Nick Morgan, uh, as already been said. Uh, so we are producers uh, of various festivals. We have 128 festivals on our books in various capacities. We service them, whether it be through doing licensing, but more often than not these days, we do everything from uh, initial engagement, getting obtaining the venue right through to delivering the show uh, and then post the strike. That's great. Okay. And um, Matthew, um, to Nick's right, uh, you're the um, executive director of Notting Hill Carnival. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory, but if you, <laughs> if you maybe add a little bit of context, you're obviously involved in the Association of Independent Festivals as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm currently CEO of Notting Hill Carnival. Um, I think most it kind of speaks for itself. Most people know the event. Um, it, that's really about pulling the, the, the communities together that put on Notting Hill Carnival. Um, I always say there's like 125 creative directors in Carnival, that's whether that's all of them, the costume bands, the sound systems and the steel bands. They all have autonomy um, and creative control themselves. So um, it's about pulling, to get, pulling them together and, and doing, you know, organizing the team that administrates the event. And our role is more around the safety and, you know, and making sure the event runs smoothly. Um, as Chris said, I'm also the newly appointed chair of AIF, which is the Association of Independent Festivals. Great is... stuff. Okay, and um, to your right we have Fran Martin. Um, can you just uh, give us a little bit of an overview as to your role at Fruct? Yeah, uh, Fran from Fruct. Um, Fruct is a marketing agency that works in music and entertainment. We work with brands that want to activate in these sorts of spaces. So a lot of work at music festivals, um, owned, initiated events for brands. Um, but basically, I, I head up our live events at Fruct. Fruct is part of um, a wider, uh, a bigger agency, shall we say, Octagon, which is sports marketing. And my role sits across both. So if I'm not at music festivals or entertainment events, then I'll be at big sporting events like Wimbledon or working on Champions League final, um, things like that. Great stuff. And Kirsty, obviously at AG Europe, you're Executive Vice President of People and Culture. Um, can you just talk us through a little bit about what that involves? Yeah, uh, hi. So I've been there for about 12 years. I'm responsible for all the people and culture across AG Europe. So UK, Germany, France, Sweden. Um, and across all aspects of our business, so supporting each of the CEOs, whether that's arenas, venues, festivals, promoters, ticketing, um, and look after both sort of permanent salary teams, and then we've got our event hourly paid staff, and then provide support for our contract, contractor and partner relationships as well. So before that, kind of providing outsourced support for smaller organisations that don't have HR, unless they have a point of pain, um, and then before that, kind of working with the sport, leisure and hospitality business across Compass Group. Lovely, and, and Zoe, um, can you talk us through a little bit about your work at GBA and uh, obviously Birmingham ceremonies? Yeah, hi everyone, um, I'm Zoe, director at GBA, so we are a full service production agency. We work in experiential, uh, cultural sector, uh, also uh, theatrical, so we work in West End and international theatrical events and a lot of the immersive sector as well. Um, and as Chris said, I was uh, executive producer for the opening and closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games. So we set up with our partners Done and Dusted, the entity that delivered that on behalf of the organising committee for Birmingham 2022. Okay, lovely, thank you. Well, um, 
there are various statistics out there, but one of them is that 96% of, uh, of event organisers suffered um, from a loss of uh, staff during or, or post-pandemic, um, and that the situation remains very considerable. Um, Nick, can you just give me an idea of how that's impacted you since um, you know the, the business got rolling again after after the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, at our level, it affected us. We uh, struggled. I mean, currently, we've still got site, seven live positions, which we're trying to fulfill. Uh, there's, you know, massive pull to the Middle East for obvious reasons. Their tax regime's far more favourable. So we're losing lots of talent, as is the whole industry uh, to there. But I think also, really importantly, and uh, it's fairly obvious, but the supply chain. So within that supply chain, obviously, labour shortages are huge. Uh, some of that brought about by... Uh, Brexit. Uh, but for us, you know, they are instrumental into delivering a show. Without suppliers, we have no show. So across the industry, it's been really, really challenging to sort of headlines around security being really challenging. You know, they've pivoted into uh, much more uh, well-paid industries, whether that be in retail, for example, uh, and they're not stood in the pissing rain for 12 hours a day. They're stood in a much more comfortable environment. So it is hugely challenging. Uh, I think from our side, we are seeing those labour shortages be suppressed slightly more, but it's still, you know, it is a concern of mine, and I've been banging on about it for long enough. But it... <laughs> Okay, and, and Zoe, obviously, you know, the Birmingham ceremonies were large-scale, spectacular events involving a lot of personnel. How challenging was that last year to, to, pull, a, to pull a team together? Um, it was really challenging. I mean, I think we had a really unique position where you're given a blank piece of paper, some protocol that you need to do, and a brief to create two amazing shows, putting the athletes at their heart and some DCMS money. Um, and it, it, so it was a chance, I think someone mentioned about doing a reset. So actually from day zero, it really made us think about absolutely everything. We worked with Celia Donald, who was on the sustainability panel this morning. She was our social values advisor. And we sat from the very start and there was really for workforce, there was three objectives. We've got 306 roles to fill rapidly. And we were in lockdown when we were appointed. Uh, so we started the work in January 2021. Um, so the industry was on its knees anyway. So this golden opportunity to, to create lots of work and, and, and give freelancers work. Um, a lot of those have been already been sucked up or we're still stuck on Expo. I think, as Nick mentioned, a lot are in the Middle East um, and a lot of the people that, you know, automatically do ceremonies in these large stadium shows. We had to make sure that the the workforce represented the city that we were showcasing and that was really important. So, again, it was really important for us both morally but also where we were to make sure we looked at the diversity of the workforce um, and also to create opportunities. So we took risks, is what we did. We took calculated risks in terms of creating new opportunities um, where within the workforce, and it was everything we were talking backstage, but from finance to administration to stage management to show call to technical to costume, everything you'd put in a large-scale stadium show or festival, effectively, um, and looked at where we could create grassroots opportunities, take industry professionals that maybe hadn't worked in that kind of environment before or had never worked in events before, mentor them, surround them with professionals that have travelled the world doing that and shoulder them on that journey. And we actually ended up with um, a local workforce of about 33% and almost 50% of our workforce had never worked on an international ceremony before. Um, so we really tried to make sure that we were creating those opportunities um, and also trying to think outside the box, putting people in the creative team that were um, young talent. Our musical director was 25 and a young rapper from Birmingham. We surrounded him with the musical director that had been doing it for 30 years um, and the support structure, but then he then brought in his connections and would say to me, well, our part of the community never thought you'd even talk to us about this kind of thing. So it was constantly thinking outside the box, whether it was the creative team or the production team, about how you can access people that don't even know these jobs exist and really taking risks where we could. Okay, sounds amazing. I mean, Matthew, how much of an issue is it for you going forward and what initiatives are you putting in place to bring on board you know, young people in, in the way that um, Zoe was talking about there, supporting people, bringing them into the industry and mentoring them. Is, is a lot of that happening at Notting Hill? Um, that, that's really what Carnival is all about. The 125 I mentioned earlier, whether it's a sound system or a steel band, each one of those are, are communities in themselves um, with d people of different ages, young people coming, coming through. Um, 
I think in, in terms of from the, the, the wider organization, I think what we've found is we, we partner with a lot of bigger companies that do some amazing things and have often said to me, you know, we'd like to look at getting some more diversity into our workforce. And um, my view is that I don't have people f from our community come and say, no, there's barriers, I can't get in. Um, they don't know that these jobs and roles exist, so I think um, what, we, what we try and do is explain to people, that we, and with the partnerships that we do have, um, explain to people that there are these roles and opportunities that, that people can get involved in, because a lot of the time there are, they're, they're open doors, but nobody's pushing or knocking on them because they, they don't know that the, the roles exist. Yeah, just sticking with the sort of diversity um, uh, theme there, in terms of, um, you know, what, 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 what are, the, are the channels that you, you see that the wider industry is missing out on in terms of ways to contact or ways to, to, to pull in people from various communities? Are, is the industry working hard enough to, to, to get those jobs in front of people? To be honest, a lot of the times it, it's superficial. They say, oh, we want to get some diversity in. Unless, unless that's ready packaged up, someone to go who's going to fit in with them, they're not really willing to do the, the work. A lot of work needs to be done about education and, and bringing people in, whether that's kind of mentorship scheme or getting people in, in for experience. Because, you know, once they see what the industry is like, they'll realise that, you know, it, that, that it can be quite enjoyable and very fulfilling. And uh, in terms of the, 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 the kind of the mentoring and, and um, those, what, what kind of schemes have worked particularly well for you so far? We, we were involved in the Kickstarter scheme in 2021, um, which kind of, it went so well, it kind of backfired on us. It worked really well for the p participants. Um, some some organisations are able to offer full-time work, for, but with us, it's very, like most festivals, it's seasonal. So. We had five young people um, on um, as a Kickstarter program. One was doing our social media. Somebody was a, we had a YouTube channel manager. We had an events manager, and they all, at the end of the six-month scheme, went and got really good, well-paid full-time jobs within that role, which we weren't able to um, offer them, unfortunately. But it was successful for them, and we put some some new new talent into the to the workforce pool. Okay, thank you. I, I wanted to go to you, Kirsty. I mean, I, you know, as I sat there writing stories all day, I've seen quite a lot of announcements of new uh, AEG staff, you know, and it, and it looks like there's a pretty diverse mix of people that are being either promoted or employed, which is, which is great. What, how much of a focus is there at AEG on bringing in the right people? Obviously, it's key to bringing in the right people, but how much of a focus is there on, on making sure there's a diverse flow of new staff coming in uh, and existing uh, staff are given the right um, guidance and, and opportunities to move on up the, the ladder, as, as it were. Yeah, I mean, it's been a big journey for us. I mean, we, we were late to the party, if I'm honest. There was a lot of external facing back in 2017, 2018, and kind of a lot of tick boxing. And my view is, if you're going to do this on a journey, you've got to start internally first. And, you know, you look across the AEG Worldwide board, lots of white males, all been there a long time, right? So if you can't change that dial because they're not going anywhere, where do you start? And we had to start by educating because you can't bring people into this organization if they don't get it um, and, and the business don't understand. So we started at that point really focusing, partnering. I mean, I've been at this for a long time, right? But it's all new to me. I'm an HR generalist. So partnering with the right people that can help educate boards um, and then we set out a charter. It's as simple as this is what we're going to do. We didn't go as far as targets, but we really changed the dynamics um, and started from a recruitment point of view. So ripping up the CVs, just application forms, diverse hiring panels, because too often people will go, oh, yeah, me and blah are going to meet. Well, that's great, but that's two white males, right? So how are we going to shift the dial? So we did quite a lot, and we had the opportunity. We were really educating before COVID, and then post-COVID, we were kind of like, now we've got to bounce back, and now we've got to get out there and really recruit. So all of the stuff that we put into place have, has helped to shift the dial. Um, but 
you can only do so much bringing in the talent from external. You've got to develop the, in, the internal talent. And that's the journey that we've gone on as well. So, you know, we've made sure that there is that career path for people to move on. We're not perfect, but we're on that journey. And, you know, really proud. We announced yesterday um, 48 promotions just in the UK this year. And probably 85% of those are female. And that's from every discipline and every business. Um, and that's just why people thinking about things differently. So, you know, we've, we've got it from that, that aspect. And again, from looking at our hourly paid staff, we don't have challenges. We, we don't have the diversity challenges. But you've got to be able to partner, properly partner, with the job boards and the recruitment and the, the, you know, the government agencies. They don't necessarily just want to support you because you're ticking a box. And so that's a really interesting you know, journey that we've been on as well. Absolutely. You mentioned at the outset you, 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 you know, partnered, you, made, you, yeah. you had some key partners. Can you give some examples of those partners that may be beneficial for other people? Yeah, I mean, look, we kind of went, where are we going to start? Um, and we, I mean, it's no, um, we work with the inclusive group who have been at this for a long time. So um, they kind of did an initial audit of our business and went, right, where do you start? Is it internal promotions? Is it recruitment? Is it the board? How are you going to you know, change the dynamics? And we just literally put in a plan for all the things we could do in three years. Um, and rather than set ourselves targets that maybe we wouldn't have hit, we literally set ourselves celebration points. Um, and that has continued. We literally have taken all of that work. Um, and you know, even as in a couple of weeks, we, we've got a board update. So the partnership come in and literally educate our senior leaders of what is new, what's on the, what are other people doing, where, are you, where should you be focusing? And I, I think that's really, really key. Great stuff. Okay, Fran, so for, for you, I mean, what, how much of a focus is, clear it's a focus, but you know, how are you making sure that the, the people that you're attracting and bringing into the industry and your team are from a diverse uh, background? Yeah, um, well, I think it is, if we sort of go back half a step, it's why we do this as well. Um, you know, from, a, from an agency point of view, we're working with brands that want to market what they do to all sorts of audiences. You know, some of them are certain music fans, some of them are fans of certain sports, whether it be F1 or whatever. There's all sorts of audiences we're marketing to. And if we are a sort of monoculture at our place, we're gonna really make ourselves unappealing to so many clients. Uh, if we, you know, if we put, if we put, and again, it's, if we, if, yeah, if we, we need to be a diverse workforce because it makes us better. You know, to your, to your uh, point about your rapper in Birmingham there, you didn't do that because it was a fuzzy feeling. He probably made the show better. He um, did. You know, so um, there's, there, that's, that's why we do it. Uh, well, we do it for all sorts of reasons, but you know, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do on all sorts of levels. And we, yeah, we, we again, particularly since sort of um, the last 18 months or two years, since we've been really building back, we, we looked at ourselves and we were like, and we've, we've recruited so many people, I'd say 50% of our agency has new faces in the last year. Um, we're 140 people in Shoreditch, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and a lot of those are, are new people, so we've been on a massive recruitment drive. And it was so important not to just recruit, you know, you know like not, not just build back the same thing you had or, or just sort of just keep going in the direction you went. So we've got all sorts of initiatives. We, um, you know, things like grad schemes get spoken about so much, but so many people are not graduates. I'm not a graduate. Um, and uh, it, it, sometimes, you know, you fish in the same pools and you, and you get, you, you, you'll be getting the same fish. Um, so, We've looked at different places to actually uh, promote, our, promote our work, let people know about what it is Fruct or Octagon does, because you know, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the uh, we're, not, we're not famous like a, like a Notting Hill carnival. Um, so yeah, we go to, we go to all, we, we, we turn up in different places. We, we, did, a, we did a sort of um, a jobs fair at Spurs Stadium last year which was very much around um, you know, promoting all sorts of potential careers to people who might not, might not have considered them. Um, there's, a, 
there's a football club called Hackney Wick FC, and the guy who started that, he put on a football tournament last year called the 32 Borough Cup, which is about getting young people to play football, right? And he also did a jobs fair, sort of adjacent to it, and we turned up and we had people from our place uh, telling them, by the way, um, you know, every year I go to the Champions League final and I put on this event and I do, you know, this and that. And the people there, had, you know, again, had, had no idea. There were other big brands there, Nike, Netflix, that sort of thing. And we were talking about it before, but, you know, sometimes what people see is, is one side of a business. You know, you look at, you look at a, like a, a Netflix and you think of the, the stars on the screen. But there's a whole ecosystem behind it. You know, obviously that's film and TV, not events. But, you know, there's, there, it's just letting people know and going to different places and, and uh, telling them about what it is. And again, we do that not because it makes us feel fuzzy, but because actually there's so much talent and there's such a, there's such a need for talent. You know, like I say, you know, people got open job positions. There's a lot of, you know, looking for good people. And uh, hopefully it makes us better as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, could I, mean, I just come in with something? Sure. I think that I think the, the events um, community can really benefit from diversity in its widest sense because we're always talking about diversity and that's often talk, speaking about colour. But there's so many layers to diversity, neurodiversity, disabilities and things like that. People from all of these communities can really help what we do and it, and it makes everything better. I mean, for me, Carnival is probably the biggest celebration of diversity and inclusivity. And I think when we're speaking about diversity and changing things, we should also extend that to neurodiversity, disability, you know, everything, the whole gambit. We, so I feel, I feel a bit um, narrow. Yeah, I mean, and again, it is, it is easy to fall into a certain uh, vision of what diversity is. But you know, we happen to we work. We also work with some consultants who are all about accessibility, uh, called Studio Exception, uh, and they basically help us um, make our work uh, more accessible for people. And again, not just from a you know, uh, there are, there are certain things that should just be standard. You know, people can enter a venue, all that sort of thing. But some people have got um, you know, some people have got introvert personalities. Do you not want them to come to, you know, do you not want them to feel welcome? So there's all sorts of, you know, make, it's one thing getting people into your business, but then it's another thing as well, making them stay. Because, um, yeah, you know, you, what you don't want is to be bringing in grassroots, and then two years later, they, they're like, this isn't the place for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nick, obviously, you know, before you make any progress of anything, you've really got to assess exactly what you're doing in your own organisation and whether it's truly diverse and you're in the right place to... To, to push that forward. Um, what, what, um, what kind of self-reflection have you kind of done as an organisation? I think it's really important, that, you know, it's a bit like greenwashing, isn't it? CSR a few years ago, everyone just ticked a box uh, for the sake of it, and many people didn't know what it meant. Uh, I think for us, it's really important, I think, for everyone to actually understand the true issue. So looking at self-reflection, undertaking training, you know, we've done things like anti-racism training. You know, everyone's got micro-assumptions, microaggressions. I would tell anyone in this room different. Um, so it's important to firstly understand that. And I think for us, everyone talks about onboarding, so it's really important to get a diverse workforce. But even more importantly is retention within the workplace. So, <clears throat> you know, that hasn't been spoken about, but it's really, really important as well that that environment is also understanding uh, and getting to those different audiences. And we're working with various partners uh, like Mentivity, who are down in Peckham, uh, diverse, who do what I say on the tin. You know, we need those partners. You know, we don't know necessarily uh, where that readership is. Um, so it's, it's so important. And from a commercial point of view, you know, for festivals, who are our clients essentially, we want a much more diverse audience. Um, so it's really important to understand their, their needs. Uh, and I think not enough of that's happening. There's a lot of talk around diversity or DNI. and uh, I think more needs to be done uh, in the interim stage, which is understanding from your business, uh, you know, what you need to do and understand the, the true problem that exists. Okay, thank you. Um, this question's uh, for you, Zoe. Obviously, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of work to do and it sounds like there is a lot of work happening in terms of making sure that we have a more diverse workforce in the future, but there is obviously the, the issue of making sure we have a robust and full capacity workforce too. And one of the statistics I was uh, presented with the other day was that only 40% of events uh, degree graduates 
go into the industry, which is slightly concerning. So if that's the case and they've studied and they're still not going into the industry, what, what are we doing wrong? What can we do to make the events industry more appealing to more people at a younger age? I think it's a really good question. And there was the talk this morning about the government support. I think the awareness of what we do. Um, Rick Stainton is doing his Power of Events campaign, trying to get out there in terms of who we are and what we do. Um, with my sort of other hat on in the theatre space, again, we talked about it, it's quite elitist. If you haven't been to a drama school, you know, you don't even know these opportunities exist. We have running productions at the moment where there are the need for um, automation operators in theatres. We cannot get them, and that could be someone that could come in um, at an apprenticeship level, be skilled up, um, and take that opportunity. Um, I think there's a perception that, you know, the events industry is some lovely sort of corporate parties and some festivals and nothing in between. And there's the breadth of what we do, I think, is 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 so key to be known. Um, when we're in Birmingham, we absolutely, of course, engage with universities and colleges because that's so important and we had some incredible talent. Um, but we did our own apprenticeship scheme. And yes, that was a dedicated producer. That was resource. That was resource from our HR team. And, you know, we put that budget aside from the start. And we put out the... Um, uh, for 10 apprenticeships um, within the uh, creative and production team. We had 390 applications in two weeks, um, and hardly any of them were from a university background. They were all young people that didn't even realise these opportunities existed. And I think just to pick up on a point for retention in those roles, um, one of uh, our production managers um, at GBA sort of looked at me one day and said, I only came to work here because I like the fact that it was a male-female partnership and there was a woman doing a job in a technical environment. Um, and she'd always been told in her training that it was very, very male orientated. And like you say, it's not just about um, you know, the colour of someone's skin, that that is incredibly important. It's about age, it's about gender, it's about socioeconomic background. There's so many ways we can do that. And we had an apprentice on a Kickstarter scheme and he was wonderful. Um, and he, had, he couldn't afford to go to a festival or an event or a theatrical production. So as part of that, we included an incentive and we um, offered tickets and opportunities for him to be part of the world because we were all sitting in the office talking about what we'd been to see last week or what we were going to see in the summer. Um, and he didn't feel that he could connect with us as an organisation. Um, so I think it's looking at what you're... Um, we are by no means getting it right. We're learning every single day, and it's a massive journey. Um, but if that's an external mentor, or if that is people outside of your organisation that, you know, can really connect with people and have those conversations that maybe I can't have or can't connect in the same way, I think it really helps with, with the retention. But it's... As an industry, there's a lot we need to do in terms of accessing people that just don't have an event management degree. And I'm keen to hear other thoughts as well in terms of what everyone else has been doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just touching on the the, the value of the, the the degree. I mean, degrees. I mean, I, I, so, Kirsty, you I'll put this one to you. I mean, are you satisfied with the kind of the strength, if you like, or the quality of the kind of graduates coming out of the university system? And are there enough universities providing those courses? Are the courses like robust enough? And uh, is it a good resource? You know, is the university system a good resource of of, of uh, young event professionals? Um, I think it's a mix. I think, you know, we, I wouldn't recruit someone just whether they got a degree. I mean, you know, and especially within our organisation, it's around their experiences. And I think it's about, to your point, it's about opening up those opportunities at such a young age. And I kind of, as well as put my people management hat on, if I put my parent hat on, my son's just left school, right? And at every point of careers, opportunity, conversations, Guess what they're churning out as careers? The same stuff they churned out when I was there. You can, be in, you can work in the council, you can work in the police, you can work, go in the army. Like, at no point, no one has talked to him about a job in this space at all. So my view, from what it is, is every kid leaving school needs a stint in a hospitality. Go work in a pub and a restaurant and a festival and a be on a site or whatever it is. And that, for me, will give you a lot more experience coming into our, an organization like ours. And a lot of our talent, we get them at, at sort of guest relations entry levels. You know, come and work at the O2 as an event. And their eyes light up because they're kind of like, oh my God, I didn't know all this happened behind the scenes. And, and that for me is, that plus a degree? Yeah, great. But that, I mean, we've taken out CVs. So we, because to your point, you look across the organisation at the event, at the audit level, 
And there was a lot of the people, guess where all the finance guys came from? The same schools, the same universities, right? So we take that out and just don't even ask the question. So it's definitely a balance, but it, for me, it goes back school. You've got you to be able to, it's a cool place to work, right? And they, they just, they've got no idea. Matthew, obviously, you know, Nothing or Carnival is known around the world. Um, in fact, during the pandemic, you know, you built digital platforms that have kind of extended the interactions, if you like. It's probably never had such a, a big audience of people able to, you know, get involved. Um, so it's, it's hugely well known, but do you still, I mean, I'm, I imagine there's, you have a plethora of people wanting to get involved in it. Or do you find that there still is, you know, do you struggle in any way in, in, in terms of encouraging people to, to come into the... Um, a lot of people do want to get involved, but I think, especially at the moment, people are looking for certainty with, you know, the, the, the crisis we're in at the moment, you know, people want a nine to five, you know, year round job that they can, that they can get involved with. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a while before we, t as, a com as a country, we get to a comfortable level where we can get that kind of, and, and this is across all of, the, you know, especially festivals, where, where you can't offer people, a, you know, a solid job for, for 12 months of the year. Um, it's going to, I think it's going to be, continue to be a struggle for a while. Um, it wasn't prior to, um, I'd say, 2017, 18, but, but Brexit and the pandemic has just, changed everything so we've got to look at things differently i think one of the things we was, was touched on earlier on was obviously welfare you know the welfare of staff and when you've got a situation where there are areas in the workforce where there are you know there are there are gaps um it just ultimately means that people are going to have to work extra hours you know the event has to happen the event has to happen on time people are going to end up working extra hours it goes back to that issue of mental health and people being put under enormous strain nick do you feel that well, first of all, this two-part question. Firstly, how much of an issue is it, do you believe, and is it likely to be this season? Um, and, you know, we have to address that if we're going to appeal to people or if we're going to make the industry seem appealing to people to get involved in it. Um, so is enough being done to, to kind of work around it? Uh, I mean, it? I think, uh, as an industry, we're amazing at selling shows, talking about the show, and then, obviously, the promoting the talent that's involved in that show. We are terrible. We're absolutely shocking at talking about how good the industry is, so everything that happens back at house. So, uh, you know, and people like Rishi has not helped with that. You know, ballerina, if you remember, during COVID, suggesting that we should all go into cyber is absolutely insulting and ridiculous. Uh, given that photo itself was created by a load of creators within our industry. So I think, firstly, it does need go government intervention. It needs promoting uh, to uh, the point over there just in regards to, you know, the archaic nature and the, le the lag that is within uh, all of these university programs. We need to be promoting uh, the events industry far better than we are because how people, you know, they're not attractive. Uh, to Matthew's point, once they've actually done a show, they're involved, often, you know, they love being being involved uh, and they'll stay within that industry uh, and I think in terms of like the welfare point I mean in our in our particular business uh, it's called hero hours um, and it's something we almost have a disciplinary nature to so if people really think they need to be on site for 16 hours a day uh, we will then injunct it and put in a disciplinary position saying you don't you know you, there's, there's loads of ways around it through phasing uh, you know I appreciate costs with suppliers where they you know Obviously you need two sets of crew, but again, you can phase plans, and it's really, really important. After 12 hours without breaks, you are not going to make good decisions, uh, and therefore you are then infringing on the danger, you know, the health and safety protocols of that show. It is so important, and it is a legacy that remains in the industry. And I don't know why, but I see people, you know, consistently talking about these hero hours, and almost, uh, you know, almost like this jostling for who did the most hours on site. That is totally, totally unacceptable within our business. Uh, and it's something we've worked really hard on over the last four or five years. And we were guilty of it, including me. You know, I did on one particular show, 27 hours, stint six years ago you know by year you know by uh, hour 22 i was not making any sane decisions but it was because of a massive crisis on site so i felt i had to be there but again it comes from the top down so all of our directors again we subscribe to that making sure there are breaks making sure there are loo days for example because you know we have that many shows back to back uh, i think it's absolutely essential and needs to be promoted as well you know for industry-wide sure and um 
the other aspect of it as well is obviously if you have a fluctuating amount of work, if it's, you're intensely busy during the summer, but then there's other periods of time where you don't have so much work on, then that again, it kind of loops back to that same thing. It doesn't seem such an attractive industry to go in. Um, Zoe, what, do you do you find that do you feel like the industry is doing enough to kind of because you do need to create a kind of a structure or a framework whereby there's consistent, constant work? And obviously, what happens in an industry like ours is you end up having an awful lot of freelancers who will work, you know, in in fits and bursts, and you know, can anything be done? I mean, the very nature of our industry when we talk about big, major, live outdoor events is that it's primarily summer. So, is there any room for manoeuvre in terms of trying to sort of build the, 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 the workload across the year more smoothly? Um, I think it's a really good point, and I think we all saw how heavily freelancers were affected and by some of the government decisions through lockdown, and I think we're still feeling that now. And as a result of that and other things, we've lost a huge amount of incredible freelancers, many of whom, as we know, have gone to TV and broadcast and film because of better pay in lots of areas and, uh, like you say, more longevity throughout the year in terms of filming schedules and, I think, more regular work. We've certainly lost a huge chunk um, from, from our, our resource on that. I think, and I don't say this lightly, you know, all the conversations this morning about supply chain and costs, I think we have to take our clients on that journey with us. And I think it's getting better, but I've spent the last couple of years kind of educating investors, clients, the budget, ultimate budget holders of why we're making certain decisions, how we have to look after our staff, pay people properly, um, and invest in them. I think it's, it's all sort of how we feed into each other and I think collaborate together um, and, and work together across the industry. Collaborations come up a lot this morning and yes, there are lots of competitors in this room but we're all working for the same thing and I think if we can try and work together and, and support those, those freelancers through that process, we've tried to put some uh, freelance on retainers um, and try and sort of look at that throughout the year in terms of giving them some security. Um, again, with the conversations with suppliers, we're getting a lot of questions of, well, I need to know, or I need to deposit, or I need a contract, I think, at an earlier stage, for all the reasons that we've talked about. So I think it's trying to forward plan and take people on those journey, and the balance of having your regular brilliant people that you love and add value to your team, as well as everything we've talked about and bringing in new talent, it's a balance. But I think taking clients on the journey and really collaborating together with people and forward planning as much as, as possible, and hopefully we are coming out of the pandemic now and forward planning is gonna be a little bit easier for everybody. Okay, and I'm going to um, I'm changing subject a little bit here, but this this question's for you, Fran, because you're obviously in in marketing, and I'd just like to get your perspective on this. Um, the, just by the nature of mainstream media, it will jump on any kind of disaster or bad news it seems to come first. So if there's a security incident, if there's a death at a venue, if there's a, if there's fires at Reading, whatever it is, it seems that our industry quite often will get in the media because something sensational has happened and quite often that's involved with someone being in pain or in trouble or, or something like a, a fire at a festival, as I say. Um, and then you've got kind of a series of, you know, documentaries, you've, you know, like the Woodstock 99, the Fire Festival, things like that, that don't exactly paint a great picture of our industry. It's very hard, you know, there's, it's not an exciting story for the media to focus on how amazingly we, you know, we talked about London, Operation London Bridge earlier on, perfect example of what we're capable of as an industry. But is there, there just seems to be that, you know, what can we do to try and, uh, to, this is in the context of appealing to people to join the industry. What can we do to kind of uh, work on the image of the industry, if you like? Is that people talked about maybe producing a documentary about the, you know, the amazing work that goes in and the, 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 the um, challenges that are overcome and the, you know, the, and that can, could, you know, the, that could be made to be very ex interesting and exciting and, and kind of, you know, have a good momentum, that kind of film, if we looked at it properly. Sort of after very long, probably the longest question in the world. <laughs> but, um, you know. I agree with everything. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, is there anything we can do to kind of to, to make our industry appeal more to, to the. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And this is something I. I it, it, that, that news cycle thing is, is almost a, a whole other um, conversation. But it's something I, I think about a bit where, you know, we're all plugged into the news and the whole thing about, you know, even sort of grown up media outlets is they need people to keep coming back and keep checking in and keep, you know, so bad news gets people's attention, but it also stresses everyone out. Like, you know, we, we our, our sort of human instinct is to get stressed when bad things happen. So I think 
not tuning into all of that news all the time is, is sometimes good for us. That's a slight aside. Um, it's an, it is also an interesting one because um, making an industry appealing and what format to use for that. Um, we, you know, we are, we're, we're an events industry. You'd think the natural format to make that appealing would be to put on an event, you know? Um, but, you know, we, we also, one of our clients is, um, is, is Netflix, so obviously they make fil film and TV. And we did a, an event for them last year, um, which was on one level to promote the fact that new season of Top Boy was coming out um, on, on Netflix. But actually, it was not just a premiere. It was a it was a, a a workshop. It was a day of workshops for young people wanting to get into film and TV. And that's interesting that you know they used the live event to promote. They, you know they didn't. I mean they do many things, but they used the live event at the Truman Brewery. They had a thousand young people come down throughout the day, and they learned about wardrobe and everything that goes on behind the camera. Um, so for me, I think. Uh, there's nothing like being there, and that's why we're all, you know, that's, that's why we are in the industry we're in. So for, so for me, it's about giving people as, as much access, you know, look behind the curtain, you know, be, be, be part of it. But that is easier said than done because of reasons, you know, and again, when we're talking about um, accessibility and that sort of socioeconomic thing, you know, people, not everyone can give up a weekend to come and take part in something. Um, you know, I remember my first my first job. I got paid my lunch money to for three months to 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 get into events. Right, um, I could do it not not because I'm very rich, but you know, I could do it because I had support of my family. Some people can't do that, so I think it is about meeting people where they are. So that might be doing things through social media, certain channels, but also you know, turn up where where they are and and, and try to try to invite them in that way. Because I. I I think it's a very, it's very, uh, it, our, our work comes through in the doing, right? It's, it's a very practical thing, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, 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 not, it's not theory a lot of the time, which sort of blends into that um, degree course piece, you know, there's certain people I definitely would want to have a degree, like a, a you know, doctor or a surgeon, something like that. Other people less so, like certain creatives or, or whatever. Um, so I, I, I think there's many ways of, of, of um, promoting what we do. Um, and again, sometimes I think it's about just pulling back that curtain and, and, and some of the schemes that we've spoken about, um, inviting new people into it. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we sort of speak about at our place as well is when we are inviting new people into, into work, sometimes, and it's a very sort of common thing that people hear in work, isn't it? Um, culture fit, you know, are they a culture fit? Are they a culture fit? And we just stopped, like, we, we, we sort of flipped, well, we started saying culture add, you know, what are these people adding to our, to our culture? Um, and that's, you know, because, because we don't want everyone just to come and just to fit in, because otherwise we're just going to, you know, we're going to become derivative almost. So, long-winded way of answering your long question, but <laughs> I, I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I, think we should, I think we should show up in the way we, we, we do it best with, with live but also, of course, embracing where people hang out. If people are hanging out on social media, people doing that, then, um, yeah, meet them there. Okay. Can I just come in on that? Sure. I mean, we all employ amazing talent, right? So use them, tell their stories, and just, you know, to your point, collaborate. If we're all doing it, you know, we've just launched their My AG story, and we've told stories internally about our, you know, just varying different, team members and we put it out on social and yeah you know we went through the whole oh my god our competitors are just going to poach our people right but if everybody does it we will continue to tell the story of these amazing people that have awesome careers in this industry and it will just we can use that and it's whether it's social whether it's video whether it's just creating that content and the more authentic it is and the less kind of glitzy and glamour the better because it's their real story, and that's what the people all buy. Um, I completely agree, and again, not so well I'm burning in too much, but the main reason we access loads of local talent and young talent, it wasn't me ch chatting around, talking to people, it was that we got about 10 ambassadors that took a long time to engage with, and they were very wary of us, and all these Londoners that come up, and um, you know, and actually we were all white, all the senior management team, and we changed that very quickly. Um, but they went out to community centres, to youth centres, and they talked about what they 
they were doing, some of it was on social, some of it was on TikTok, um, a variety of different methods for different things. But they were like, oh my God, I didn't believe this. And I remember having a conversation with our, our principal in the opening ceremony. She was a young girl. Uh, she was a woman of colour. She was about 19. And we had a conversation about two days before the show. And she said, tell me about you. And I said, oh... I'm from real, I'm from North Wales from the seaside and I only did this job because I had a really good drama teacher who said, oh, you love the arts and you're really bossy and managerial, what about combining them? It wasn't from careers, it was from one person that made that decision. And she was like, what, you're, you had an upbringing like me and you're doing this job? I was like, yes. So it's, I think, like telling those stories and connecting, whether that, that's young people that are having those direct conversations and being accessible, but how we're using the incredible talent we have at all ranges and connecting in a real way. I think it's really powerful. Brilliant. OK, well, it's a good place to end it on. Um, any questions from the audience? We've got about a couple of minutes. So time for... OK, Andy on the far left there, or my far left, obviously. They'll switch it on and out. Yeah, a working microphone. So, um, Andy Lentall, Festival Insights. Um, you talk about the fact that we are an events industry and we need to find people and, and events can engage people. There is an event that does that already. Um, it happens about six times a year. It's called Production Futures. Um, I suggest you have a look at it um, because they tour um, seats of learning, education facilities that deliver events-based and production-based courses and they invite young people from, not just from that university, but they invite young people that haven't yet gone to university. Um, some of those universities just use it as a recruitment drive, but you can go, you can turn up, and you can rescue those people from a lifetime of student debt by getting them engaged before they go to university and sneaking in and getting those good people before they're ruined, uh, sorry, they're, they're put into <laughs> debt. So um, it, it exists already. Uh, and I was just looking and listening to what you were saying. You, you'd make an ideal panel. I've sat on panels, I've interviewed people. I interviewed a production manager who's the next day was literally stepping on a plane and flying off to Australia to tour Australia with George Ezra. But he gave his time to go and explain his role to a load of young people because he knows he's one of those visitors. And it's, just, it's supported by companies who have the vision to see that their most important asset isn't the next set of lights they're gonna buy, it's the next set of people who are gonna plug those lights in. So have a look at Production Futures. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Right, well, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much for this um, great panel. That was uh, very interesting indeed. Thank you, guys.